Well, welcome back, everyone. Welcome to Chapter 9, Human Development, Part 2. I hope that you enjoyed Part 1. In Part 1, we talked about some foundations of the earliest moments of life. We talked about conception to birth, and we also talked about a foundation of human development, and that is attachment. We spent a lot of time also talking about what quality attachment is. And I hope that you found insight in some of those slides and ideas. In this chapter, we're going to journey into the older age brackets. So we're going to get a little bit older and look at the different challenges and adventures of the different times in a person's life. But before we start, I have a video that I want to show you. So this video, it's going to be your job to put your psychologist hat on. And the psychologist hat means that you're looking for observable behaviors and actions. This video has several different children, and I want you to watch and get an impression of what each child is displaying. Okay, you ready? Let's watch it. I love this video so much because there's so much going on. The kid in the very middle of the video obviously is having the time of his life. And then the kid right next to him is also basking in or enjoying the thrill that his friend is having. And then you have the other kids that are trying to take in the experience as well, right? In that video, you're seeing different displays of temperament. And temperament is essentially pre-personality. When you're little, we don't use the word personality just yet with you. We use the term temperament. Because when you're little, you don't have a lot of life yet to have a track record. Personality is a person's consistent affective, behavioral, and cognitive style. And it's easier to see personality in adults because those suites of characteristics that affect behavior and cognition have become usually more consistent. With little kids that are still developing, especially infants, they don't have a personality just yet. They have a temperamental style. So the word that we use for little kids in regard to their characteristic behavioral style is called temperament. So temperament is an individual's behavioral style or characteristic way of responding. In the video that you just watched, we saw some different temperament differences, right? We saw some different ways of responding. And if we were the preschool teacher for this little dude that's cracking up so much, we'd probably see that he behaviorally and characteristically respond with joyfulness, adventure, and expression. He's very expressive, right? So he has an adventurous, expressive temperament. Now, in the infant and toddler age bracket, there are three clusters of temperament that we often use to describe different styles. Easy, difficult, and slow to warm up. So an easy child is exactly what you would think an easy child would be. An easy temperament is adaptable under routine change. They're in general joyful or cheerful. They are in general able to deal with adventures and new things. They tend to enjoy new experiences with delight and excitement. They, if something goes wrong or something is different than they remember, they adapt much quicker than those with different temperament styles. And in general, they are expressive and pretty easy to parent. You know how they're feeling and they console easily. So if, if an easy child is having a rough time, they tend to be able to be consoled quicker. A child with a difficult temperament has a different approach to life. A difficult temperament often finds change in routine to be very distressing. They don't like it when things get changed. They don't like it when toys are taken from their hand. They don't like it when we have to stay at a doctor's office longer than we thought. They don't like it when their plans are interrupted. And in general, difficult children are very hard to console. So if a difficult child is having a tantrum or crying or upset about something, they're going to be harder to calm down. It takes longer and it's more exhausting for the parent and the child to get a difficult child into a routine of safety and positivity and flow. 
They don't go with the flow, essentially. And the final temperament style is called slow to warm up. So I would say that the kids on the periphery of the video, the ones that were just sort of sitting there staring, <laughs> I would say that they're probably a little bit more slow to warm up. They're in the situation. They're not being difficult. They're not creating problems or crying or being aggressive. They need some time to take in the world before they decide whether they like it or not. In general, slow to warm up children, they don't like change at first, but if you give them a little bit of time, they become a little bit more adaptable. So a slow to warm up child might look like this. Let's imagine you have your two twin sons, Liam and Lucas, and you have them in a playland, one of these toddler, toddler zones. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of two and three year olds. And you have two twins, and so Liam immediately goes towards the ball pit and starts playing with the little balls and throwing them around and rolling around and laughing. He's got an easy temperament. But let's imagine that Lucas is slow to warm up. Lucas might be in this same situation and stay with his mom for 20 minutes first. Stay right by her. He's not crying. He's not upset. He just needs a moment. There's a lot to take in, right? So he might eventually end up at the ball pit or eventually end up at the slide or the swing or playing with Play-Doh, but it's going to take a little bit of time for him to get there. So what about you? Do you think you, when you were little, were easy, difficult, or slow to warm up? So there are other perspectives on temperament. And temperament is not the end-all be-all of describing young kids. There are some other perspectives on this pre-personality display. A couple of those domains have to do with self-regulation and affectivity. And what you'll find here is that different children display different behaviors when it comes to their ability to regulate their own emotions and their ability to have focus. So for example, self-regulation has to do with the ability to regulate or cope with what's going on for you. Some kids, even when they're little, are able to self-regulate better than other kids. So some, instead of crying, might find something to snuggle with. Some, instead of crying, might go to an adult and cling on. Um, some might grab their hand and maybe suck on their thumb or do something to self-soothe. Whereas other kids don't show that self-regulation and will often tantrum or cry. That same difference can be shown in negative affectivity. Some kids display and consistently display more negative affect, that's negative emotion, crying, screaming, hitting, spitting, <laughs> being mad, being sad, being angry, being frustrated, than others do. And what does this all mean? This means that different kids have different needs. Each of us, and that's us too, right? Each of us has a unique constellation of brain, development, neurons, and connections. We come with different temperaments and have developed those temperaments into different personalities. Just because something is easy for one kid doesn't mean that it's easy for another kid. So it's really important here to have a perspective on the caregiving element of temperament. Not all kids are going to enjoy the same activity in the same way. In that example I gave with Liam and Lucas, you're going to have to adapt your parenting style with Liam and Lucas. Liam is more adventurous. Lucas is more cerebral, more thoughtful, more logical. They have different strengths and weaknesses. So quality caregiving is going to be able to focus on what each child needs and what each child needs to learn. And the parent's job is to assist the child in being able to grow in their ability to regulate their emotions, to display good social skills, to be safe and kind with others, and to be able to have coping strategies when the world is not perfect. And you know, these skills are not just for babies. They're not just for toddlers. These skills are something that you and I are still working on ourselves. So let's take a mindful moment here and work on our own self-regulation. Part of the way that we work on our self-regulation is by staying present in the moment. 
Okay, so let's be present in the moment. Go ahead and close your eyes. Get in a relaxing position. Take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. Okay, we're gonna do that again, but I want you to self-regulate. I want you to actually try to slow down your heart rate a little bit. All right, take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. and open your eyes. Were you able to self-regulate a little bit? Did you calm down even a little bit? I hope so. Okay, before we go on to the next slide, we're going to think a little bit about our caregivers. What type of caregivers did you have growing up? What were they like? What type of style did they have with you? You're gonna keep that answer in mind as we move forward. So we wanna talk about different parenting styles now. And there are four different parenting styles and each of them have different strengths and weaknesses. Baumrind, the researcher that outlined these, found these to be the main styles displayed by parents. But also keep in mind that not everybody has a mom and dad per se as their caregiver. They could have a grandma or an aunt or an adoptive mom or, you know, it could look different, but the style of the caregiver is what we're talking about here. So caregivers have different styles. The first style that we're talking about is the authoritarian style. In an authoritarian style, the parent places a high value on conformity and obedience. Parents are often strict tightly monitor their children and express very little warmth. In contrast to another style that we're gonna see, which is called the authoritative style, authoritarian parents probably would not relax bedtime rules during a vacation because they consider the rules to be totally set in place and they expect obedience from their kids. The authoritarian style can create anxious, withdrawn and unhappy kids. In an authoritarian home, you're going to have parents that are extremely rule focused. They want you to follow the rules. They want you to respect their authority and their authority. That's it. There's no discussion about the rules. They said it, you do it. That's it. So these parents are very strict. They don't give their kids a lot of freedom. An unfortunate side consequence of an authoritarian style has to do with when you don't give your kids freedom, the very second that they have some freedom, they could very much rebel. Or they could show a lack of initiative or a lack of confidence in regard to how to communicate, how to engage with the social situation or how to do something. If they've just been following rules all the time and they didn't have an opinion, if you ask them their opinion, they're like, oh, what do you, what do you mean? I don't normally have one. My mom tells me everything that I'm supposed to be doing and thinking. So the authoritarian style in summary is all about rules and all about respect. You will follow my rules. This is not optional. This is not up for discussion. Your feelings don't matter in this thing, my way or the highway. Stick to my rules. How many of you had authoritarian parents? How do you think that impacted you? Our next style of parenting is called the authoritative style. With the authoritative style, the parent gives reasonable demands and consistent limits, expresses warmth and affection, and often will listen to the child's point of view. Parents will set rules and explain the reasons behind those rules. But these type of parents are also flexible and willing to make exceptions to the rules in certain cases. For example, you might relax bedtime rules and the bedtime routine if you're on vacation and want to go for a nighttime swim. Your bedtime rules therefore might be relaxed. They won't be so rigid because you understand you're at a family vacation and it's a special circumstance. Of all of the styles that we're going to discuss here, 
The authoritative style is the one that is most encouraged in American society, and it shows the best outcomes for kids. American children raised by authoritative parents tend to have high self-esteem and very good social skills. So let's talk a little bit about why that would be the case. So authoritative parents, and again, the data is going to show, especially in Western societies, that authoritative produces the best outcomes for children. Authoritative parents, they're basically parenting with love and limits. And they're using a lot of emotion coaching and mentorship and discussion and empathy as part of how they parent. So whereas the authoritarian parent is doing all limits, the authoritative parent is doing love and limits. Because a child really does need both. We need to learn healthy boundaries and where the safe zones are. Those are limits. And we also need to learn that we're loved and we're good and how to love other people. So this authoritative approach is correlated with a child's social competence. They're better at social skills. They have and display more social responsibility in helping behavior, pro-social behavior. And they will also show more self-reliance. This is all because these parents are talking about why the rules are in place. An authoritarian parent would be like, that's the rule. I'm not explaining it. Don't break it, you know. <laughs> but an authoritative parent would describe why the rule is in place. Well, here's the rule because we don't want these things to happen. And it would be sad if that happened, right? So we're taking care of our items. We're not touching that because... How many of you had authoritative parents? What did you learn from them? The next parenting style is called neglectful. I think your textbook might call it uninvolved. So with this uninvolved style of parenting, parents are indifferent, uninvolved, and sometimes neglectful. They don't respond to the child's needs and make relatively few demands on their kids. This could be because of depression or substance abuse or other factors, such as the parents being overly involved in their work and their work life. These parents may provide for the child's basic needs, but they don't provide for their emotional needs or their needs for limits or their needs for social skills, boundaries, emotion coaching. The children raised in this parenting style are usually emotionally withdrawn, fearful, anxious, and perform poorly in school. And these children are also at an increased risk of substance abuse later in life. So if we talked about the authoritarian style having limits and no love, and we talked about the authoritative approach having love and limits, the neglectful or uninvolved style has no love and no limits. The parents aren't doing their job, essentially. And that's really hard. That is a really hard thing for a kid to deal with. Kids need to look around the world and learn about the world from healthy adults. They need to see people that care about them. That helps teach them that they matter. This helps teach them what they need to be doing later when they're a friend or a coworker or a parent themselves. Neglectful parenting styles are correlated with less social competence and less self-control in the child. And this makes sense. The child really hasn't gotten a lot of mentorship on what they should be doing and who they are and what the boundaries are and what the good things are and what the bad things are and what they need to be doing in their life. And if you've ever had a caregiver that neglected to step into some of those places and either protect you or understand you or speak with you or connect with you, you know that those hurts run really deep. So if any of you were ever raised in a situation like this, I just want you to know from my heart to yours that I grieve that that happened to you. But I'm so proud of you. Look at you. You're in college. You're surviving. You're thriving. You're making it through to the next thing. That's amazing. And our final style is the permissive parenting style. For parents who employ the permissive style of parenting, the kids run the show and really anything goes. 
Permissive parents make few demands and rarely use punishment. They tend to be very nurturing and loving, and they may play the role of a friend rather than a parent. They are love and no limits. Not surprisingly, children raised by permissive parents tend to lack self-discipline. And the permissive parenting style is negatively associated with grades and academic success. The permissive style may also contribute to other risky behaviors, such as alcohol abuse, risky sexual behavior, especially among the female children, and increased display of disruptive behaviors by the male children. So these parents often do love without limits. Love that doesn't have limits doesn't teach a child that there are boundaries. And part of becoming a successful adult is learning where the boundary lines are between you and other people. What do they have access to? What do you have access to? And what are we each individually responsible for? And boundaries and limits are good. They're good for us especially if we understand why they're there and for what reason. So for example, you lock your car when you get out of it and you do that because it's yours. You have responsibility for it. It's something that's important and treasured. It's an important part of your life of getting from point A to point B. And also you don't want anyone else to take advantage of it or disrespect it or use it or take it. That boundary is good. And in the same way, it's important for a kid to learn that there are some boundaries in their social life, in their individual life, and in their family dynamic. So a permissive home has lots of goodies and lots of positive experiences and really anything goes. So there's lots of freedom. But unfortunately, freedom that's given without limits sometimes hurts kids. So for example, if I have a 13 year old daughter and I let her go wherever she wants, whenever she wants, with whoever she wants, I'm not protecting her. I've given her a lot of freedom, but it's not fair to give her that level of freedom because her brain can't handle that level of freedom. There are different strengths and weaknesses in her life right now. And it's my job as her parent to monitor her and protect her from herself and others. So permissive styles are often correlated with some lack of social skill, some lack of respect for other people and poor self-control. A lot of that comes down to having poor boundaries. Now, if your parents didn't teach you good boundaries when you were growing up, it becomes hard as a young adult and an adult, it becomes very hard to have healthy boundaries with other people because you haven't really seen it before. So what do you think you guys, do you have good boundaries in your family? Do you have good boundaries with your friends and the people that you care about? How are your boundaries? All right, moving forward, we want to talk about another theorist, probably one of the most important theorists in this chapter and in the realm of developmental psychology, and that is psychologist Jean Piaget. And what a delightful researcher. So this is a picture of him right here. Um, he had a really tender heart for kids. He had kids himself and he was fascinated watching them play and watching them interact with the world. He was interested in watching them problem solve as they play and he was watching their thought processes and their creativity and how they were coming to different conclusions about objects and items during playtime. Watching how they solved problems differently at different stages. And believe it or not, you guys. There was a time in psychology when thinking about the way that kids think was not really a priority and they didn't really even think about kids having different cognitive or mental processes. That probably had something to do with the relatively low social status of children in different cultures and times, but this is what makes Piaget so special. He's really, really delightfully engaged in the adventure of trying to assess how kids think as they grow up. So to Piaget, Piaget is gonna see kids as like little detectives. They are trying to understand their world through inductive and deductive reasoning at different stages. 
as they try to learn why things happen, how they happen, what they are, and how they interact with these things. So children, therefore, actively construct their cognitive or mental world using mental structures and mental operations. So what do we mean when we're talking about mental structures? What do you mean, Bryn? Well, essentially what Piaget is going to say is that this little kid, as he is like a detective, he's getting his hands dirty, he's looking at the evidence, he's playing with stuff, he's interacting with his world, and he's actively trying to understand the world. He's actively constructing, building, and understanding the world around him. One of the ways that he does that is through schemas or schemata. So schemas are concepts or frameworks that help a child understand packets of information. So I might have a schema for dog and a schema for cat, for example. Okay, so growing up, I have this idea of what mom is, what dad is, and what dog and cat are. These are different schemas or frameworks that help me understand the outside world. It helps me organize my experiences into these little packets of mental understanding. Part of the way that I learn in the world is by using assimilation and accommodation to either grow my schema or adjust my schema as new information comes into my system. So assimilation would be applying an existing schema to a new experience, therefore expanding the schema of a particular item. So let me give you an example. So let's say growing up, I'm little and my house has cats. So we have kitty cats. So it's one of the first words I learn. It's kind of what I learn because it's in my house. So it's kitty, right? So be nice to kitty. This is a kitty cat. This is a cat, right? So kitty cat. So I have a schema for cat. If my mom and dad take me over to their friend's house and their friend also has a cat and I go kitty and they're like, yeah, kitty, that's great. Yeah, that's exactly the kitty cat. See? That's assimilation. It's a different cat than mine, but also it's still a cat. So yay, I did it. I expanded my understanding or my framework for what a cat is. But we know in the world that we don't just have a constant flow of consistent experiences. So let's imagine that my parents take me to another friend's house and I'm at a birthday party or I'm at something at someone else's house and there's a dog. And I go, kitty, because, hey, four legs, fur, a tail, ears, like small, a small dog could look like a cat to a kid, right? So if I go, kitty, that's not assimilation because it's actually not a cat. So a parent would come alongside and they'd say, no, Brittany, no, honey, this is a doggy. Roof, roof. See, this is doggy, just different than a kitty. This is a dog dog. Can you say dog? And I'm like, oh. So when I essentially have to accommodate for new information and I have to adjust my schema, that is accommodation. I have to alter that pre-existing schema of kitty and branch it out into kitty and doggy. There's two schemas now. And it might look something like this. Cats are small, they have fur, a tail, and they go meow. Dogs can be small. They have fur. They have four legs. They have a tail, and they go woof woof. So I've created two mental structures or schemas that help me organize the world around me. And you know, you guys, you do this too. This is not just for little kids. This is for us too. As we take in new vocabulary terms and new concepts and new stuff in our life, we're constantly adjusting our schemas. We're assimilating information and folding it into our pre-existing understanding, but also accommodating and branching out and making new categories and understanding things more broadly. So when you're doing your college work, you're doing the work of assimilation and accommodation as you try to actively construct your knowledge of the world around you. All right, so we're gonna walk through the four stages of cognitive development of Piaget. 
We're going to start with the first one, sensory motor. So the sensory motor stage happens between birth to two years old. And essentially, this stage is where a child is using sensation, sensory, and movement, motor, to understand the world around them. They're trying to coordinate their sensations with their movements. Like, hmm, if I kick my leg and it presses against the blanket there and it makes the blanket move, hmm, what's that? Like actually sort of coordinating the feeling with the moving. During this earliest stage of cognitive development, infants and toddlers are going to acquire their knowledge about the world through sensory experiences and by manipulating and touching and moving objects. A child's entire experience at the earliest period of this stage occurs through basically reflexes, senses, and motor responses. During the sensory motor stage, children go through a period of dramatic growth and learning. As kids interact with their environment, they're continually making new discoveries about how the world works. Now this cognitive development occurs over a relatively short period of time, but involves a great amount of growth. Children learn not only how to use their physical body and perform physical actions, such as crawling and walking, but they also learn a great deal about language and items from the people with whom they interact. A key feature of the sensory motor stage that happens in the last part of the sensory motor stage is something called object permanence. Now object permanence is the belief that objects continue to exist even when they can't be seen anymore. So playing a game of peekaboo with a little kid really is kind of exciting for them because where did you go? Or if you hide a toy under a blanket, they might be like, whoa, where'd it go? And then you, you flip the blanket off and they're like, oh my gosh, there it is again. It's like so exciting. They thought that it was gone because they are sensory motor. They're just dealing with the world as it comes into them. At the tail end of this stage, they're going to start to acquire the ability to understand that the teddy bear is under the blanket still. Despite them not being able to see it, it's still there. And the same thing is true of their caregiver. If mom steps out of the room, it doesn't mean that she's gone, gone. It means that she'll be back. So what are the key features of this stage? The infant is going to be able to know about the world through their sensations and their movements. They're going to learn about the world through basic actions that involve reflexes like sucking, grasping, looking, and listening. They're going to eventually learn that items continue to exist even when they don't see them, which is object permanence. They're going to learn that they are separate from other people and the other objects around them, that they are a unique person. And they will start to realize that their actions can actually cause things to happen in the world around them. Whoa, when I press that button on that toy, it starts playing a song and starts lighting up. That's so cool. I did that. So essentially through this stage, children are going to progress from being only based on sensations and reflexes. <laughs> you think about this when you see a little kid. They'll grab anything that's close to them. It's like they understand it by trying to eat it. It like immediately goes in their mouth, right? Cell phones, necklaces, toys, um, other people's hands, their own hands. They're <laughs> very sensation based, right? But as this stage develops and they get older and they gain more and more of an appreciation that objects exist even when they don't see them, it is during the final part of the sensory motor stage that early representational or symbolic thought starts to happen. By learning that objects are separate and distinct entities and that they have an existence of their own outside of whether the kid sees them or touches them or tastes them or not, children are able to attach names and words to objects. They're able to represent them in different ways. So whereas before I might have earlier in the stage, I'm only able to play or understand with something when it's right in front of me. It has to physically be sensed. I have to physically sense it. 
Later in the stage, if you take that toy and cover it with a blanket, I can still represent the fact that, oh, that little stuffed animal toy, it's under the blanket. Kitty, toy, bear, I'm able to represent it with a name and also know that it exists even though I can't sense it, feel it, taste it, or use my sensation to apprehend it. All right, the next stage of cognitive development, according to Piaget, is the pre-operational stage. And this stage lasts between two through to about seven years old. The main characteristics of this stage involve the fact that children start to think symbolically and use words and images and pictures to represent other objects. So I have here a picture of a little kid drawing. And this is very much a pre-operational task and a pre-operational development. Children at this stage tend to be quite egocentric and struggle to understand things from the perspectives of other people. And while they're getting better with language and thinking, they still tend to think about things in very concrete form. So they're making developments in symbolic thinking and being able to understand things in more abstraction, essentially. They still have a hard time understanding things in non-concrete ways. The foundations of language development may have been laid during the previous stage, but the emergence of language is one of the major hallmarks of the pre-operational stage of cognitive development. Children become more skilled at pretend play during this stage, yet they continue to think of things very concretely. So for example, if in their schema of firefighter, it has to be a boy, in pretend play, if they see their little friend Sarah put on the firefighter costume, they might freak out and be like, nope, you can't do that. Like, nope, that's, that's not what a firefighter is. <laughs> you know, they can't go outside of the box there. At this stage, kids learn through pretend play, but they often struggle with logic and taking the perspective of other people. They also struggle to understand the idea of constancy. That constancy goes by another name, and that is conservation. So conservation has to do with the fact that something remains the same despite me altering it. So I'll give you an example. If I took a piece of Play-Doh, and I took it outside of the Play-Doh jar, and I put it down on the table just as it comes out of the jar, you know, it looks, it's totally in that shape, that little jar shape. And I go, okay, let's look at the Play-Doh and I'm with a kid in the pre-operational stage. Okay, look at the Play-Doh. See, see how much there is here? And they're like, yes. And then I take my hand and I flatten it down so it's spread out. And I go, okay, do I have more, less, or the same Play-Doh now? Kids at this age have a really hard time with this task. Many of them end up saying that I have less or more. They could either think I have less because it's lower on the table, it's not as high anymore, or they might think I have more since it's spread out and it's bigger in what they can see. But many kids in the pre-operational stage are really going to struggle with this conservation tasks. Okay, so let's move on to the next stage of cognitive development, and that is the concrete operational stage. And this stage lasts approximately, according to Piaget, between 7 to 11 years old. During this stage, children begin to think logically about concrete events. They're going to gain that conservation skill that was not apparent in the video that you just watched. So they're going to begin to understand the concept of conservation. Their thinking becomes more logical and organized. But it still has some limits, it still has some rigidity to it. It's not great at abstraction. It's not great at being tremendously flexible of understanding the gray in between black and white. Children are going to begin to use inductive logic or reasoning from specific information to a general principle. And while children are still very concrete and literal in their thinking at this point, they do become more adept at using logic. 
The egocentrism of their previous stage begins to disappear as kids become better at thinking about how other people might view a situation. They're going to be able to have better understanding of other perspectives. It's not perfect, but it's getting better. Kids in the concrete operational stage also begin to start to understand that their thoughts are unique to them and that not necessarily everybody shares their own thoughts, perspectives, feelings, and opinions. So kids at this stage are going to gain tremendous logical ability, but it's still imperfect. So we're going to see skills like classification, seriation, putting things in order, transitivity, which has to do with logic skill, reversibility of things going added and then subtracted back, where they can go both directions, and even conservation. In the last stage of Piaget's cognitive development, we have the formal operational stage. It is proposed by Piaget to last between 11 to around 15 years old, and into adulthood, essentially. Now, quite interestingly, the research shows that not every adult reaches this stage of cognitive development. But let's talk about it classically in the way that Piaget intended. In the formal operational stage, the adolescent or young adult begins to think abstractly and to be able to reason about hypothetical problems. They call this hypothetical deductive reasoning. So at this stage, Children are able to use abstraction or abstract thought. And they're going to begin to think more about moral or philosophical, ethical, social, political issues that require some bigger thinking and some flexible thinking. They'll also begin to use deductive logic or reasoning that goes from a general principle to specific factual information. And all in all, this final stage of Piaget's theory, it involves an increase in logic, the ability to use deductive reasoning, and an ability to understand abstract ideas, big ideas. At this point, people become more capable of seeing multiple potential solutions to a problem and are able to think scientifically about the world around them. The ability to think about abstract ideas and situations is the key hallmark of the formal operational stage. Also, the ability to plan for the future and reason about hypothetical outcomes are also critical abilities that emerge during this stage. So what we're seeing here is that young kids are able to see situations as being a little bit more gray than just black and white. They're able to have hypothetical knowledge of like what would happen if so they're not so grounded by what is, they can think about what will be, and they're able to use increased deductive ability. All in all, one of the most important elements to remember about Piaget's theory is it views the knowledge process and the intelligence process as being inherently active. Kids are actively being part of their learning and their growth. It stresses that children are not just passive recipients of knowledge, that they're constantly building and investigating and playing and experimenting with the world around them to understand the world around them. It's important to note also that play and playtime is so imperative for kids. The American Academy of Pediatrics has mentioned that unstructured playtime is an imperative part of a child's development. It builds creativity, problem-solving skills, and social skills. It also allows children to develop a theory of mind as they are able to take on the perspective of other people and improve their executive function or their perspective taking. And Piaget would be happy to hear that because he really thought that play was a kid's work, that play was the place that they start to construct their knowledge of the world and how it works. Now, before we leave Piaget entirely, I want to make note of something that has a reemergence in this formal operational stage. In the formal operational stage, we see the return of a term that we saw before, and that is egocentrism. So in the teen years, even though teens are making great strides in logical thought and abstraction, there is the reemergence of some level of egocentrism. 
And for them, that egocentrism has to do with a preoccupation with their own self and the belief that others are as preoccupied with them as they are with themselves. They have this sense of uniqueness and this sense of invincibility. And that uniqueness and that independence and also that I'm going to live forever stuff can sometimes lead to poor decision making and risky behaviors. Outside of Piaget, we do know that in the early stages of adolescence, the medial prefrontal cortex of the brain, that's the front part of the brain that has to do with executive function, there is a pruning process. That means that the cells actually prune themselves in the medial or central part of the prefrontal cortex. They prune themselves during early adolescence, around 14 or so. And this literally and biologically means that teenagers have a hard time taking the perspectives of other people. Their brain is pruning and reorganizing at this timeline. And the area that it's pruning and reorganizing in has to do with stuff like perspective taking, empathy, and decision making. Now, the prefrontal cortex has to do with attention and intention. So if it's pruning during that time, it's no surprise that teenagers have a hard time seeing situations as risky or, or making perfect decisions. You'll see that in that age bracket, there's a great tremendous potential for adventure and risk, but not a lot of cognitive inhibition or self-regulation. That area of the brain is reorganizing at that time to be able to give them restraint, boundaries, and problem-solving skills. So what does this mean? This means that the teen years are adventurous and there's lots of really great and really difficult things about those years. Okay, we wanna continue our understanding about the foundations of developmental psychology. And we can't leave this chapter without talking about a theorist by the name of Vygotsky. Vygotsky had a socio-cultural cognitive theory and Vygotsky's theory is important to us because it sees kids as being able to learn from expert adults as well as mentors that might be a little bit above them. Vygotsky's theory is different from Piaget's theory. Piaget's theory is just focused on the individual kid and their mental processes. For Vygotsky, learning has to do with the society that you're in, the culture that you're in, and how you think about problems in the group that you are learning those things. So the child becomes essentially an active participant in the socio-cultural context of what they're learning. There is something important here called the zone of proximal development. And for Vygotsky, there was a zone of learning in which the child learned the most called the ZPD or the zone of proximal development. And that zone had to do with a child being placed in a situation where it was too challenging the math problem or the language arts question or the task that they had to do was too challenging for them to do by themselves. But they could do it with the minimal support of someone supporting them or scaffolding them or helping them up. And that zone is the zone where a kid learns the most because they're challenged, but also helped at the same time. So what's a Vygotsky takeaway for us? Well, a takeaway for us is that you're gonna learn the most when you're challenged by a situation, but also doing it with peers and peers that might be even a little bit ahead of you. And that peer mentorship goes both ways. Sometimes you're the peer that's learning from someone else because they're a chapter ahead. And sometimes you're the peer that's helping someone up to get to your level. I know that's challenging right now, right? We're all learning kind of on our own. But according to Vygotsky, we do best when we do this learning together. Another perspective in regard to cognitive development is something you've seen before, and that is the information processing approach. As you'll remember from chapter eight, the analogy of the human mind as a computer with inputs and processing and outputs, that's the information processing approach. 
So the two domains that are going to be the most important to this theory and approach are going to have to do with memory and executive function. So for those of you elaborating or making connections between chapters, this makes a perfect connection with chapter eight. All right, now we want to move forward to another really important person in this chapter. We talked about Piaget, we talked about Vygotsky. Now we want to talk about Eric Erickson. Eric Erickson is a developmental psychologist and his unique perspective has to do with socio-emotional development. And his theory is going to emphasize that that development, it goes through the lifespan. It's not just going to be childhood into adolescence. It's not just going to be infancy to the time you turn 18. It's going to be throughout the entire life. So therefore, he has eight different psychosocial stages of development. Each stage represents a task that the person that's experiencing it must resolve and understand in order to move forward. And those tasks he called a crisis, that every stage has a crisis. But I want to reframe for you what Erickson meant by crisis. When you hear the word crisis, you probably think of something bad or tragic or negative. Erickson didn't really mean crisis in that way. He didn't mean it as a trauma. He meant it more as an opportunity for growth. So you can substitute the name crisis with opportunity or challenge. I think challenge is a good, a good substitute word to help understand that. Each stage has a challenge, a developmental challenge. And in each stage, the person is either going to come out of it having more personal competence and a feeling of achievement of that challenge or feeling weaker in regard to that challenge. So before we dive into a quick review of Erickson's eight stages, what is a challenge in your life right now? What is something that is a core deep challenge that you're experiencing? How can you apply the growth mindset to this? How can you apply some problem solving to this? How can you learn through this challenging situation? Okay, the first stage of Erickson's theory is trust versus mistrust. In this stage, a child has to learn or has the challenge of affirming that the world is either trustworthy or is not trustworthy. A child navigates this time in their life, this crisis, this challenge, by the attachment work with their caregivers. A child gains trust in the world if their basic needs are met by sensitive caregivers. This is the secure attachment that we were talking about in part one of this lecture. This stage is one of the most important of all of the others because it's the foundation on which the other stages are built. So you might ask yourself, well, what happens if a person doesn't gain trust in the world? Well, it does make the other challenges even harder, right? But since people, and that involves children and teenagers and adults, we have resilience, we do have hardiness, we do have the ability to make sense of the world even when things were rough. So what someone that didn't have such a great start would do, according to Erickson, is they would go back to that challenging place and build some trust. So maybe their parents didn't teach them trust, but maybe they can be a good caregiver or they can trust some safe people themselves. And every time you navigate a challenge, by coming out of it a little bit stronger, a little bit more wise, you're a little bit more ready for the world around you. And that's a good thing. In the next stage of Erickson's theory, we have autonomy versus shame and doubt. And in this stage, the challenge is learning to be able to readily explore the environment without being punished for it. Now, since this age bracket has to do with essentially the toddler years, this is around 18 months to three years old. If children in that age bracket are allowed to explore safely 
and they're given positive, safe experiences in exploration, they're able to affirm this sense of autonomy where they have agency over their actions and they have the ability to make some decisions. That's good. The opposite of that is being raised in an environment where there's constant no's. No, don't touch that. No, don't do that. Those sort of things of shame and doubt, they work against a feeling of autonomy. Autonomy allows a child to discover and assert their own will. That they have something that's theirs and they have agency and volition. Now, just letting kids do whatever they want to do at this age bracket is not safe for them. It doesn't help their autonomy to have them play with matches or play with dangerous things. So autonomy develops only under healthy circumstances, right? The healthy circumstances mean that I give my toddler, they can wear whatever pants they wear, but those pants have to fit them and those pants have to be clean. So you can choose any of these things. You can say yes to any of these items. In regard to playtime, if I've given them a play option, I'm giving them safe options to play with. So I'm not giving them freedom to be harmful to themselves or others. I'm giving them safe freedom, freedom to say yes to things that are good for them. Now, please don't think that permissive parenting is autonomy. There has to be boundary lines. There has to be no's because there's items in the household that they can't play with and they shouldn't play with. But what a good parent does here is instill a sense of autonomy in their child instead of them constantly feeling like they're in trouble or constantly feeling like they're getting no bad boy, bad girl sort of messages. The next stage of Erickson's theory is initiative versus guilt. And this happens approximately between three to five years old. So we have preschool through to about kindergarten in this age bracket. And continuing from the former stage, we're seeing a similar crisis or a similar challenge. And that challenge has to do with facilitating initiative, positive, enthusiastic, safe initiative into our kids versus guilting them and making them feel bad. So a kid navigates this stage successfully by being challenged to assume age appropriate responsibility. That is, you put your dishes away in the sink when you're done, or you're learning how to tie your shoes, or you're helping mom with a task and good job. That was so helpful. Thank you. It's important in this age bracket to allow kids to make age appropriate decisions for themselves. So that might be stuff like choosing between broccoli and carrots or choosing which treasure chest piece to pick out of the goodie bag or choosing which pair of shoes to wear. If the pair of shoes, um, if they're all safe, then I'm giving the kid initiative by allowing them to choose. Now, when I don't let my kids choose things that are age appropriate for them, like there's, it's safe. It's safe for them to choose from their own shoes, right? When I pick out the kid's outfit for them, I instill a sense of guilt in them. And that guilt is that their mom didn't think they were a big boy or a big girl. And their mom didn't think that they could pick their own shoes. A helicopter parent or a parent that makes all the decisions, does all the hard stuff, creates a place where a child has no challenge and no opportunity to show initiative, no choice. Everything is always safe and sheltered and decided for them. That's not good for kids. That's not, it's not healthy. We need to teach even little kids that within safe boundaries, within what is age appropriate, that they have freedom to decide some things. And you know, a lot of parents get kind of weird on this. You know, if your kid wants to wear a weird hat to church or something, like, it's okay. <laughs> like, you know, if the hat just looks silly, that's not a big deal, right? So we want to create places for a kid where they have freedom to choose. Did you have a lot of choice when you were little? Safe choices? Could you pick what you wanted to eat from some healthy options? Could you pick which one of your clothing items to wear? The next stage of Erickson's theory takes us through school. That's like elementary school through junior high. 
approximately ages 5 to 13. In this age bracket, the challenge for a child is industry versus inferiority. At this stage, kids should be, if they're industrious and they are, being supported in their attempts at being industrious. They're learning and mastering knowledge, intellectual skills, and learning how the world works. So for example, you might have your child that's really interested in technology take apart an old VCR or an old cassette tape player or something that wasn't being used before to understand how the pieces fit together. And yeah, it, it, he kind of made a mess because there's items all over the place. But you're just like, hey, buddy, that's awesome. What are we learning here? Let's build something new. You're giving your child a chance to be industrious, to learn how the inside of something works in a safe setting where you can affirm their industry. You can affirm their mastery of knowledge. And school is meant to be a place where you feel industrious and you feel like you're growing in your knowledge. But we all know, because we were all in school, myself included, we all know that there's places where you don't feel so industrious, you feel inferior, because everybody else understands the concept, but you don't. In this stage, we're not saying that a kid is going to perfectly understand everything at the highest levels all the time, but we're saying that the child has the psychosocial, the social-emotional resources to be able to master and feel good about situations where they can build and create and problem solve. You know what? Even if that math test was kind of hard, I'm still learning and I'm still like growing in different things. I can build other stuff and I, I, I you know what? I'm going to be okay. I'm still good. I'm still learning. I'm still able to build knowledge for myself. I still have skills that can be built. As you can see, those school experiences are going to be super important to this age bracket. And parents and teachers and peers and friends and coaches play a big role in this crisis point or this challenge point. So here's a question for you. Do you have anyone in your life that's in this age bracket that might need a little bit of peer mentorship or a little encouragement so they can feel good about themselves and feel industrious? If so, why don't you reach out to them? In stage five of Erickson's theory, we have essentially adolescence. Um, so this is approximately age 13 through to about 21. Um, but this is going to be the time in life in which the big crisis or the big challenge has to do with identity. Identity versus identity confusion. The acquisition of a firm sense of self is the big challenge of adolescence. And teenagers will very often try on different identities and different roles. So one year they're gonna be on the dance team and be the dancer, and the other year they're gonna try on being a goth chick. And I think we all have an appreciation how trying different roles allows an adolescent to try to figure out who they are. Okay, what group do I belong to and how do I fit into that group? Who do I want to be? Who am I? Those are the big questions of this psychosocial time. And you know what's really interesting about the time of adolescence? They're really at this weird place of having to navigate the fact that they want to be unique and stand out. They do. They want to be, they want to be unique. They want to be individual. They want to be independent. And that's good. That pushes them towards independence and their own person. But at the same time, oh my gosh, they socially want to belong so bad. And it literally physically hurts their body to miss out or feel like they're missing out of being part of a group. They want to be part of a group. So it's almost like you're torn in two a little bit in adolescence between wanting to be unique, but also wanting to be part of the crowd so bad. And you know what makes that time period and that crisis easier is a sense of identity. Adolescents that have a firm sense of identity and are committing and achieving that identity, they're able to navigate those two worlds between independence and belonging to a group. They're able to navigate it and integrate it by making sense of who they are. Okay, I'm Bryn. I'm a unique individual. I have these things about me, but I also belong to these groups and have these affiliations and it's part of who I am. 
I am both Bryn and a group member at the same time. Parents can help their kids at this stage by allowing their kids to try on different identities. It's actually very normative for a teenager to try on different roles, different hairstyles, different music, different groups of people, different goals for life. Trying on those different places is part of their job in that time period. It's a safe time to adventure and role play with different selves. So parents actually do their kids a benefit when they are cool with the kid trying different things. Safely, of course. You know, we're not trying unsafe things. But if your teenager wants to dye their hair purple, if it's okay with the different roles in their life, like if there's no problem with it at school or on the soccer team or whatever, then what's the big deal? It's just purple hair. It's not like, let them get it out of their system. Let them try. Maybe there's just something about that that makes them feel important for the season or makes them understand themselves better. So when it comes to safe options of trying different roles, a parent should be a champion for that. A parent should be a champion of their child understanding who they are, trying different things, being adventurous, independent, but also understanding themselves in the process. In the next stage of Erickson's theory, we see intimacy versus isolation as the crisis or challenge. This age bracket would be approximately, according to Erickson, around 21 to 39 years old. And what we're seeing in this age bracket is that individuals are either forming lasting, intimate, and deep connections with others or not. Now, when Erickson originally did his theory and had his age brackets, people married pretty quickly after high school. They were marrying earlier. But we know that now women and men actually marry a little bit later. So some critics of Erickson's theory would say that perhaps some of the age brackets need to be pushed back to adjust for sociocultural changes. Regardless of which age bracket we're using here, this stage, its theme has to do with intimacy. And intimacy has to do with a close, trusting, deep relationship between two people. The research shows that some principles for successful marriages and intimate marriages has to do with nurturing a fondness and mutual admiration between people, turning towards one another with friendly affection, and trust. It involves also understanding that you're not the boss of everything at all times, and that means that we have to commit to one another. You know, in the Bible, sometimes the Bible will use a word called submission. And believe it or not, that submission term actually means co-mission, or under the same mission. So, in that sense, a healthy marriage has a healthy level of co-mission, being under the same mission. When we do that, we both have to commit to one another or work along with one another for the goal of something healthier and better and safer. And that means solving conflicts together and communicating. Research has shown that if there's contempt in a marriage or contempt in a relationship, Contempt is a unique emotion, and contempt is a blend of disgust and pride. And where there is contempt in a relationship, the relationship is less likely to survive. So as you can see, all of these principles, according to the research, show us the opposite of contempt. We see fondness, admiration, friendship. We see sharing and being committed or under the same mission together. And we see communication and working along with one another to solve problems, which inevitably will come up. A good marriage really should be two very healthy people becoming one awesome team. They retain the individual awesome features of who they are, but they also form an even more awesome team of diversity of gifts. So, like my husband, I love my husband so much. He's so different than I am. But, you know, back to back, when we're battling through life together, I've got some strengths, and he's got some different strengths, and we're able to get a lot done that way. That's a cool thing. 
So you find yourself, you find yourself somebody that you can do battle with, that you can battle through life together with in a good way. So when the bad stuff happens, you're still standing. You want to find those people. In the next stage of Erickson's theory, we see stage seven is generativity versus stagnation. And this would be essentially from around 40 to about 65 years old. The goal for this season would have to do with building a legacy. That legacy has to do with parenting and grandparenting and mentoring the younger generations around you. You don't have to be a parent to be part of someone's legacy. Teachers, coaches, important peers can be very much part of that legacy, right? Assisting the younger generation to achieve the things that are uniquely important for them. And in this stage, a person has generativity if they feel like they're guarding and generating a wellness and a contribution to those next generations. So this could be something that takes place at work, like social work or being a doctor or working as a preschool teacher or being a mom and staying at home with your kids or building a business that's going to be able to be handed off to your family members later. You know, there's lots of different ways to see this and a lot of different ways to understand generativity that's going to be unique to the individual. But a person has navigated this period in time if they have felt that what they've done has made a compassionate, contributing impact on the later generations. It's also important to note, of course, that parenting, it's hard sometimes. It can be very challenging. There's lots of things that can be very rewarding, and there's also a lot of things that can be heartbreaking and difficult to deal with. All in all, we just want to understand that this age bracket has great potential to be productive and positive and legacy building. That building has given their life purpose and given their productivity purpose. The opposite, of course, is stagnating or stalling. Sometimes you'll hear of something called the midlife crisis, right? So the midlife crisis would take place during this Ericksonian stage. That's when a person feels like they're stagnating and they have to adjust and deal with the crisis or challenge point to get themselves out of stagnation into generativity. And in the final stage of Erickson's theory, we see integrity versus despair. The age bracket here would be around 65 years and older. And the main question of this period of time is what have I done with my life? You can see how important the previous season would be to this next season. So the previous season had to do with generativity and purpose and legacy. Very much so, this very next stage has to do with the impact of what has been generated or not generated. So a sense of integrity has to do with a well-being through understanding the whole story of their life. And a lot of older people reminisce a lot as a way of making sense of the past. They might seek meaning through reviewing their life, looking at pictures, telling stories. My dad, who is in this stage, and you guys have heard in the guest speaker talk, you can hear him reminisce about his life. And if you were, if you were face to face with my dad, he would talk to you for probably four hours straight about Cuba and about his life and about teaching, he would just keep going and going. <laughs> I have to tell him all the time, I'm like, Dad, we've heard this, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's a good thing. That's a very normal thing. That is, that is this person walking through what has been important to them and making sense of it, finding meaning through it. At the latter stages of this age bracket, you will see people confronting their own mortality. So that means big questions, big existential questions, right? We answer those questions by meaning, by belief, by understanding the past and present. And oftentimes a person that navigates this season well also does so because they have a good selective healthy network of people 
that are part of these days for them. I hope that walking through Erickson's stages gives you a sense of the different adventures that different age brackets and different seasons of life can bring. Life doesn't stay one way for terribly long. It changes and adapts. There are new challenges around the corner. So if you're facing a challenge today and you feel a little overwhelmed about it, let's also process the other things that came before. Let's find something we trust. Let's find something that is autonomous. Let's find something that has initiative for us. Let's find something that we're industrious with. Let's find something that gives us a sense of identity. And if we do those things, we get to move forward to intimacy, purpose, and integrity. Now, Kohlberg, like Piaget and Erickson, thought that morals and a sense of moral development did progress through stages. So Kohlberg has three stages, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. And his theory, just like Piaget and Erickson, has a child walk through these stages and progress through them. So for Piaget, we were talking about cognitive stages. For Erickson, we were talking about social emotional stages. And for Kohlberg, we're now talking about ethical or moral stages. These three stages have different abilities and perspectives on morals. In the pre-conventional stage, a child is going to be very guided just by punishments and rewards. They're going to see things as having imminent justice and just things are the way they are and they have to be that way. In the conventional level of moral development, children are going to start to learn that those rules have to do with standards that are set by parents and society and social groups. And in the post-conventional stage, it's going to be an even farther developed abstraction and abstract representation about rights, contracts, morality, ethics. Now, it's interesting to note that just because someone has a moral reasoning or a level of moral understanding doesn't mean that they have that same matched level of moral behavior. There's lots of things that people think or know that they don't behave towards in kind. We're inconsistent at times. This is a concept that we're gonna talk about later called cognitive dissonance. But for our purposes here, just keep in mind this. Just because you know what you should do doesn't mean that you do it perfectly. So a limitation of Kohlberg's perspective is that moral reasoning doesn't always equal moral behavior. And there is a critique of Kohlberg's work by another researcher by the name of Gilligan. And Gilligan actually had something called a care perspective. So this perspective has to do with the fact that men and women often display different approaches to moral situations, such that oftentimes men will have a more of a justice perspective where things are like right or wrong and you have to go with the ethic and, and that's about justice, where women often will problem solve moral situations in more of a care perspective of how can we empathize with the people that are part of this? How can we tend to or nurture the people that are involved? So these are just theories of moral development with the justice perspective being Kohlberg and the care perspective being Gilligan. In my understanding of the research, the gender difference here is not all that strong or strongly demonstrated. So although it's a critique, we need to learn a whole bunch more before we make any determinations about morality being gendered. So you might be asking, so what, Bryn? Why are we talking about all these stages and why are we now talking about morality? Well, we're talking about morality because we do assume and care about its connection with moral behavior. We know that it's not a perfect thing. We know that you can think one thing and behave another way. 
But we want to, if we're a high school teacher, we want our kids in the classroom to pay attention and not be fighting with one another. We do, with our parents, want our kids to be safe and be safe with others. We want to develop our teenagers into teenagers that make good decisions and safe decisions and that are helping their friends. And as adults and young adults and older adults, we want to be people that are helpful to one another and the generations underneath us. So we do care about developing pro-social behavior. We do care about moral development in regard to moral behavior. And that pro-social behavior, which has to do with helping others, has been correlated with supportive parenting and correlated with individual child self-control. That means that supportive parents, parents that are often authoritative, emotion coaching, and pro-social themselves, are able to model for a child how to behave in those ways. And also maybe put the child in situations where pro-social behavior is rewarded and is practiced. Also, kids that have greater self-control have a better ability to be helpful to others because even though they wanted to act out in class, they decided to be a good student and help the teacher get the classroom back under control. What we're talking about here is the formation of conscience. And kids start to understand as their prefrontal cortex comes online and as they develop theory of mind, they start to understand more and more what it is to behave in a right way. What is good, what is bad. And again, we see the importance of caregiver and child interactions. When a parent and child or a caregiver and child have a positive interaction that is authoritative, emotion coaching, integrated, clear, elaborative, rich with emotional content, shared positive emotion, when those things are part of the learning and the caregiving that is part of that dyad, that parent-child interaction, a child is able to form a better sense of what is right and what is wrong. And you know, I'm a social worker, so a lot of people will often sometimes say to me, how could a person do that to their kids? Or how could this happen? Or how could this happen? You don't know what their upbringing was like, and you don't know under what circumstances their upbringing had some things in it that they didn't learn fully by the time they were parents. That's not an excuse, it's an explanation, right? And that never gives someone a free pass to hurt another person. That's never an excuse. But psychology is always about trying to explain situations, behaviors, and mental processes. How do we explain them? How do we understand them? So your caregiving experiences, your experiences growing up, they matter, and they matter a lot. So what are some parenting strategies associated with morality in children? As no surprise, warm and supportive rather than harsh parenting, that would be authoritative rather than authoritarian, is going to be associated with more morality and moral development in children. Reasoning with a child during discipline. Um, discipline means to teach. You want to involve a child in their learning experiences. You want to also help children learn to have empathy for others, to be able to take other people's perspective, to have an appreciation for what other people are thinking and feeling and where they're coming from. You want to involve a child in the decision making of their life, giving them initiative and in industry and giving them a sense of autonomy, right? So you want to involve a child in making decisions and learning how to make decisions. If you make the decisions all for your children, you don't let them flex and develop that muscle that they need to use later. Because later in life, that child is going to become a teenager and a young adult and an adult. And there's going to be a lot of things that they need to decide on. And you can't make the decision for them for all those things. They need to be able to have a good moral muscle that's strong enough to make good decisions. And as always, you want to model that moral behavior, that pro-social behavior, and those good thinking processes so a kid is able to emulate and gain knowledge from watching you 
Talk the talk and walk the walk. Okay, here at the end of the chapter, I want to talk a little bit about adolescence in a deeper level. Adolescence is the period of development that begins at puberty and ends at emerging adulthood. In the United States, adolescence is usually seen as a time to develop independence from parents while still learning and staying safe with them. Your textbook talks about it starting around age 10 to 12 and ending around age 18 to 21. But some researchers are actually going to talk about adolescence as lasting all the way into the mid-20s. Definitions aside, it's a time of rapid changes in physical, cognitive, social, and emotional domains. As stated before, adolescence begins with puberty, essentially. So while the sequence of physical changes in puberty is somewhat predictable, the onset and pace of puberty will vary widely between people. Several physical changes occur during puberty, such as the maturing of the adrenal glands and the sex glands. Also during this time, primary and secondary sexual characteristics develop. Primary sexual characteristics are organs specifically needed for reproduction, like the uterus and ovaries in females and testes in males. And secondary sexual characteristics are physical signs of sexual maturation that do not directly involve sex organs, such as breasts and hips in girls, and the development of facial hair and a deepened voice for boys. During puberty, both sexes experience a rapid increase in height or a growth spurt. For girls, this usually begins between 8 and 13 years old, with adult height being reached somewhere between 10 to 16 years old. Boys will begin their growth spurt slightly later, usually between 10 to 16 years old, and they will reach their adult height between 13 to 17 years old. And you know, the rates of physical development, they vary from kid to kid. And it makes sense that puberty would be different for different kids, right? Early maturing boys tend to be stronger, taller, and more athletic than their later maturing peers. Those early maturing boys are usually more popular, confident, and independent, but they're also at greater risk for substance abuse and sexual activity at an earlier age. Early maturing girls may be teased or even overly admired, which can cause them to feel self-conscious about their developing bodies. Early maturing girls are at a higher risk for depression, substance abuse, and eating disorders. Whereas late maturing boys and girls may often feel somewhat self-conscious about their lack of development. And those negative feelings are particularly a problem for late maturing boys who are at a higher risk for depression and conflict with their parents. And also those boys are more likely to be bullied. The adolescent brain also shows some really interesting patterns of development. Up until puberty, brain cells continue to bloom in the frontal region, and adolescents engage in increased risk-taking behaviors and emotional outbursts, possibly because the frontal lobes of their brain are still developing. Recall that this area, the prefrontal cortex, is responsible for judgment, executive function, impulse control, planning, attention, and intention. And that area is still maturing into early adulthood, into the mid-20s. We also see that the teenage brain is overly sensitive to reward. Part of the reason for that has to do with the reward circuitry of the brain. In adolescence, the baseline dopamine level, that's the reward circuitry that we've talked about in other chapters, that baseline dopamine level has lowered. That means that teenagers are literally like physically bored and their boredom, it feels worse than your boredom. At the same time that there's a drop in the baseline dopamine level, there's an increase in the release level of how rewarding it is to have dopamine active, meaning that the rewards are even more rewarding to the brain. So we see in adolescence that this period of time is not just a time of impulse 
and all emotion or all hormones. That in adolescence, the brain is trying to have adventure, take some risks, learn how to be independent. The brain is oversensitive to reward. It is seeking reward even more so than other age brackets. But the brain is also remodeling itself. This remodeling takes place in early adolescence in such a way as two things happen, pruning and myelination. So in regard to pruning, what's happening, especially in that medial prefrontal cortex, is that the teenage brain is taking out old connections in order to forge stronger and newer connections in those areas. And at the same time, you're going to see an increase in myelination. And myelination is important because we see an increase in efficiency of those neurons. A myelinated neuron is approximately 100 times faster than an unmyelinated neuron. Also, its resting or refractory period is about 30 times faster than those of an unmyelinated neuron. So myelination is a huge improvement for the speed and efficiency of the brain and the brain system. You'll see two brain areas that are particularly important to brain development in adolescence. That would have to do with the limbic system and amygdala and also the prefrontal cortex that we've already talked about. Early on in adolescence, you'll see the limbic system, the brainstem, the amygdala, really trying to process and trying to understand life. So those areas are going to be overactive as they're processing and trying to remodel themselves. Later in adolescence, you'll see the continued pruning and myelination of the prefrontal cortex. And that pruning can explain a lot of risk taking and a lot of lack of perspective taking that takes place in the adolescent years. As that area of the brain is remodeled, sometimes teenagers don't have the best perspective taking that's possible. That reminds us again of that adolescent egocentrism that returns at this age. There is this stereotype that the teenage years are awful. They're full of conflict, they're full of emotionalism and hormones raging and impulsivity and risk taking and bad behaviors. But that's not the full picture or that's not the intended picture. In healthy environments, adolescence should really be a time of adventure and of learning about your identity and about trying new things and gaining independence and learning new things. One of my favorite researchers, his name is Daniel Siegel, talks about adolescence as being the acronym ESSENCE. And ESSENCE stands for Emotional Spark, Social Engagement, Novelty, and Creative Exploration. So if you have a teenager in your life, hopefully that makes you understand them a little bit more. Or maybe it helps you understand what you've been through a little bit more. The brain, the body, the social life, the emotions, all parts of who you are undergo tremendous change, physical, cognitive, emotional, and social, over those years of adolescence. And certainly we can't leave a discussion of adolescence without talking about identity again. A researcher by the name of Marcia has four different identity statuses. Now we know that the point of adolescence is we should, if we're walking through it and we've walked through the challenge successfully, we're going to walk out with a sense of identity. So what are the different statuses of identity according to Marcia? Well, the first one is identity diffusion. This means that this person is not exploring, they're not trying different identities, and they have made no commitment to any identity. They don't know who they are and they're not looking. They're not role playing or trying different roles and they haven't committed to any sense of self. The next one is identity foreclosure. And somebody that has foreclosed on their identity has made a commitment to their identity, but they haven't explored other options. So I'll give you an example of foreclosure. If you became a bio major because your parents told you that you had to be a doctor and growing up you played doctor 
And there was always just, I'm going to be a doctor that I have to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. If that has always just been the thing that you've been told and that you've decided on, you have committed to it. You're a bio major, but you haven't explored other identities. So that is something that would be called identity foreclosure. Identity moratorium has to do with a person trying on different things and exploring different identities without making any one commitment. <laughs> so you've probably had friends that were like this. They constantly are changing and trying new things and they're a new major every semester and they've decided on a different career. They're selling things on their Facebook page. They've decided to start a YouTube channel. They're just doing all the stuff right? <laughs> they haven't made a commitment to any one thing. They're still exploring, still searching. That is moratorium. And a person has identity achievement when they have committed to an identity after a healthy exploration of different potential options. And that's the healthiest identity status. All right, so some final comments about chapter nine. I hope that you have a better understanding of yourself and other people through chapter nine. A few takeaways from here, from my heart to yours, is that this chapter really shows us the importance and the influence of parents and peers and mentors and good guys. When a parent is a manager, a counselor, and a monitor, we call this parental monitoring, that supervision is actually really important. I know it might have been annoying when you were a teenager to have your parents constantly checking in on you, but that's their job. And if you were overseeing a 13 year old, you would want to supervise her too. A good parent to teens and to young adults is going to allow them to explore their environment, learn and build those muscles, but also be involved and still be connected. This is authoritative caregiving. That is love plus limits. And the same goes for peers. Peers can also have an authoritative connection with us, right? They can have love and limits as well. What the research is going to show is you're going to have the best outcomes, the safest outcomes, the best health. So we're talking physical, cognitive, social, and emotional outcomes. If you have caregivers, peers, and friends, that have an authoritative approach, which is love plus limits. So if you don't have people in your life that have good boundaries, it's time to find people that do have good boundaries. So I hope that you've enjoyed this chapter. If you have any questions, you know I'm here. All right, you guys, that's all I have for you. Have a good week.